so we can la test large scale system uh, or at least system level TC testing. If you're uh, aware of the uh, the kernel has something called TDC now that you can when you submit patches you run this uh, TDC tests and you get uh, if you broke something the intention is eventually if you break something we'll find you, you'll find out you won't just submit patches without testing. Um, so the agenda is I could do a few minutes of clause. Who, who, who knows what a clause network is? Okay, so there's about maybe 10%. I'll go very quickly, okay? Who knows what SDN is? I'm sorry, I have to use such vaporware around marketish BS, and yeah, although I work in that space. Um, so in the beginning, there was a phone network. The, the phone network, the bellheads, created everything you guys know. Okay, if you look at uh, the original telephone switch, it's actually what you would call a bridge these days. How do you turn this on? Uh, is it this button? Okay. Okay, and the pointer. Top one. Okay. So, this was a phone switch. Okay, you you dialed in. You said, "I want to talk to the undertaker." One of these ladies picks up the phone, hooks you up with the undertaker. And um, and you talk to the uh, you, you speak to the undertaker. So humans were actually the Linux uh, well, well, were bridging calls. Then uh, about 1892, this dude Almond Stroger found out that one of these ladies was married to another undertaker, and she was routing the calls whenever anybody called for an undertaker to her husband's business. So he got pissed off. It's a, it's a good story. I don't know how many people were dying in, uh, at that time in uh, Rochester, New York. I think it's around Rochester, where he came from. Uh, but the automated switch got created at that time. Humans were replaced. In the, uh, in the 50s, Charles Kloss uh, created um, this network that you see down here. This is a phone right here, and you can call another phone through a series of uh, bridges or switches. And he guaranteed that certain arrangements of this clause network, this is called a three-stage clause network, will guarantee that at any time, if this guy is available, you can call them, right? Uh, in the 70s, a lot of, uh, so at that time, the control and the data path were conjoined. Then a lot of what we call phone freakers right now, very interesting characters. Uh, some of them could whistle the perfect 2600 hertz. Some used uh, serial box whistles. It ranges all the way up to Steve Jobs trying to make money out of that. Uh, in, the, in 1975, the phone companies created SS7, which separated data path from control. I, the paper is going to say a little bit more of this, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. What I'd like to do is to visit uh, what a closed network looks like. You have a rack of servers, which is connected to what is known as a top of rack, sometimes a leaf switch, which is then connected to a spine switch. Now, they're called switches, but they could be layer three routers. Uh, and the idea is you can go from, in a three-stage clause network, you can go from any server to any server in three steps. One, you go here, one, two, three, and you, you can, you can uh, reach anybody. Um, what's Im interesting about this architecture is that I can start with two servers, and then uh, someday I decide I want to add another server because I'm overloaded. I can build this server, some rack somewhere else, wheel it in here, connect the cables, power it up, boom, it works. Right, that's what's interesting. So, in our design in Arachne, that was an interesting feature we were interested in. So, we would like to emulate this. We, we, we borrow this idea as part of the uh, test tool. Right? Likewise, if you build a five-stage class network where you can get from any server to any server in five hops, you can build what's known as a pod, which stands for point of uh, deployment, I think. Uh, and you can actually build this out in the wild wheel it into or ship it into a container or a truck, connect cables, you send the handyman, power this thing up. That's the theory, right? And we're also interested in uh, being able to build a pod and at runtime just attach it to our test tool. Uh, pods, this is how a pod looks like. Here's HP shipping a pod. You've got many type of vendors, including, I was surprised to see SGI is still around. They're shipping pods. They, they'll ship a pod of, uh, which looks like that. This is a pod, right? It's carried in a truck. Oh, I see. <laughs> but
but it still says SGI. <laughs> okay. So H SGI is a part is a part of HP now. Anyway, what is a software defined network? Well, you separate the control from the data. Is where the data, this green part, looks like that. What you're not seeing here is each of these things actually has a special management port. Most of them do one or two. And uh, to borrow from our friends at Cumulus, this is what they would ship. You see that there's a if you look at any of these switches here, you have uh, a management port. So this goes through the data path to come back here. You're going through the data path, that's east-west, and then we have the north-south. So that part here is the north-south. This is the east-west, okay? Um, so we use the management port. So what we try to do is to emulate exactly the setup in our, in our environment. I'm going to introduce what Arachne does. So it, it is mostly interested in this piece. We have been trying to test this, but for TC, we will also test this part, right, for TDC, when we integrate this into TDC. Uh, and we want to test from uh, tens to uh, hundreds of thousands of, of these devices, but we can't afford the hardware. Um, so we want to do it on the chip, in terms of uh, CPU, in terms of memory. That was our intention initially. And we picked the close architecture. There's so many, way things, so many ways you could connect this, but if you used the close network, well, then you don't have to worry about how things are connected. You just plug it in, everybody knows, at least in modern day data centers, how, what a close network is. Uh, and you could, you know, that, that um, little design principle I spoke of, you could, you could pull in a rack two days later, or you could pull in a pod a couple days later. And of course, we wanted to reuse or create new open source components. Uh, it must be Linux and NetDev based, nothing proprietary. And yes, we're Linux bigots. So we tried a few things. Uh, Cumulus has something called v uh, VX and on an 8 gig, uh, useful, but in an 8 gig machine, we were only able to build uh, one of these. Can you go back to the single port? So, well, their setup, default setup has, I think, a couple of spines, four racks, each with one server, and that killed our eight gig of RAM. So, we just, uh, we, like I say, we want to do hundreds of thousands of those things. We can only, as a small company, you know, for 10 machines. <laughs> so, uh, VMs were just out of the picture. Next, we looked at Docker. I think it's over, a little bit over-engineered, so much, uh, crap we don't need in there, so we dropped it very quickly. But if somebody uh, is interested, we can talk. We found this thing called Mininet. It was pointed to us. It looked very promising. It's lightweight. Uh, but it now got, it's too tied to o OpenFlow and OVS, and we were trying to be independent of the, of the SDN solution. We believe anybody with whatever SDN solution they have should be able to plug in their solution to test. And they had this proprietary topology uh, definitions. One, things, one thing we liked about the Cumulus VX is they used DOT. That was inspiring to us, by the way. Thank you. Um, the other thing is, as I t keep talking about this, you'll see that uh, Arachne has two parts to it. One is sort of what we call the factory mode, where you actually build the rack or the pod before you ship it. Um, and th that part, we had thought we could use Ansible. It we, we're not experts on Ansible, so somebody could come and talk to us after this. Uh, and the problem was this thing called playbook, w inventories. We want to be able to, on the fly, add a rack or a pod, and it became a bit of a challenge. And it introduced more dependencies. As you'll see when Alex gives a demo, we have very little dependencies. We have dependencies on IP Route 2 and probably almost nothing else. All right? Um, so yeah, he here, are the, here are the components. So during the uh, uh, the time we were working on Arachne, we had to patch IP Route 2, the Linux kernel, a couple of times. Python, uh, we use dot .file, and we use KMU at the moment to build pods. So each pod is one VM. Okay, so uh, design decisions. At some point, we decided that, look, we don't want to reconfigure this in any way or shape, right? So we looked back at our, friend, the bell, our friends, the bellheads, they have this thing called geographical addressing of uh, geographical numbering. They, in fact, have a standard called E164, where if I call 613555, I know I'm calling Ottawa, Canada, country code one, 
area code 613 is Ottawa. 555 is probably my neighborhood where I live, and then the last, last four digits will probably uh, be able to identify where I live. So we decided we want to adapt this for automation purposes. It helps us to be able to build that rack and just plug it in, and everything works. Right, so we took, uh, if you look at, uh, can you go back to the triple, uh, the pod version? Yeah, that. So we could say this is a country, it's a zone. That is probably a city. And so the country code, we mapped it to a zone ID. So you'll have many of these. Uh, you come back from either the big bad internet or some other uh, zone. Uh, the area code, we mapped it to the pod. A subscriber number, well, the subscriber is one of these servers, right? So we took these addresses. So why uh, geographical addressing? It because it simplifies automation. Like I said, we could build these things on the fly outside, wheel them in, connect cables. Cables in this case are VETHs. And boom, it just works, OK? It simplifies debugging. If I'm running TCP dump and I look at the IP address, I can tell you exactly where a specific IP address is coming from. I can tell you, go walk down, walk down this hallway, turn left, rack number three, Code number five, that's where this is coming from, right? Uh, simplifies switching or routing, as, as I hope will convince you. And it very much simplifies policy management. What we do is we add three or four TC rules, and we're set, right, uh, for, for isolation. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this, is, this has been evolving. But we also uh, give MAC addresses uh, geographical addressing. We also give IP addresses, geographical addressing. Uh, so if you look at the MAC address, I think this has changed now, correct, Alex? We have only one byte that's left, and we use the other two bytes in the OUI. We c you encode the zone ID, the port ID, the row, which tells you whether it's a spine, a leaf. The direction, which is useful for finding out if the port is in this, going this way or that way, right? Is it going towards the port? Or uh, and the port ID will. So you look at the MAC address, you can tell, right? Where is this thing coming from? If you look at the switch IP addresses, if you're doing routing, then the next hop IP addresses all start with 169 to 54. And read the paper uh, or come and talk to us after. We also have a naming convention for, for the uh, devices. So all hosts or servers start with an H, underscore R, which represents the rack ID, P, representing the pod ID, Z representing the zone ID, and the leaves start with L. Uh, you'll see this in the demo. The spines all start with an S. The zones start with that. OK. Um, oh, I'm on time. Uh, so we, we run Arachne in two modes, one which is which called the L2 mode. You just plug it in, and things just start working. It, L2 has issues. Uh, so what to each of this server, what this appears of, what all of that appears as here. So if you cut it right there, these are switches. But what these guys see is it's equivalent to having thousands of ports, or whatever, however many ports here. So this is like a big switch, right? It's as if you connected every server to a port that's sitting in this uh, magical switch here, right? That's how it looks like. If someone ARPs, everybody sees the ARP. That's, that's a shortcoming. Uh, and of course, if because it's one big, uh, big broadcast domain, there's loops. So we had to run STP. So again, this is the Linux bridge everywhere. Turn on STP. Uh, yeah, there's a challenge because the FDB tables, uh, people who know the bridge, the FDB table starts growing. And the ARP tables are growing. But we probably don't care in our testing. Okay, So it's good enough for our testing. Um, and if you look, uh, if you think about it, even in uh, deployments of real hardware, how big is a Mac L2 Mac? In the hundreds, a couple of hundred thousand these days is common. Ha more. So who cares? I'll fill up the FDB table. I have a hundred thousand. It means I need a hundred thousand uh, servers to fill up all those tables. The problem, the challenge is still ARP. But if you think about it, ARP, uh, what you're generating like a hundred a second per. So the largest uh, data center I've seen was one that uh, uh, LinkedIn published. They have 96 ser racks, servers per rack, right? So if 96 by 16, and they have 60 of these pods. Not a big deal. Yeah, you'll get ARPs. So, uh, 
So that's beauty of L2, it's good enough for us, but because there's a lot of people like our friends at Cumulus love their layer three, so we, we make them happy with L3. Um, so in L3, what we do is um, we use, each of these things is now a router, right? Each, each of those essentially is a router. In from the server side to, to, uh, to the outside, we have ECMP, equal cost multipath. So a packet comes in here, depending on what ECMP logic at this router here, it will select one of the spines, and likewise, these guys will select one of the zone switches. So the address scheme I showed earlier on uh, is used from the outside as well. You know, you can look at, you can select any uh, of the spines, ECMP downwards, all the way to to, to the host, right? Um, and it's totally static routing. One of the challenges that uh, we had with this was uh, at some point uh, I was very concerned that um, um, so we use VETH and w uh, one of these uh, tools we're testing with went up here in the spine and killed a, a VETH link on this side. Uh, the event was generated here so if you're running IP monitor here you'll see the link going down but uh, routes the packets kept sending there but then uh, David Aaron sent me a patch over the week, during this week in, in, at NetConf, but now we're discovering we probably don't need his patch anymore, but we haven't tested. VETH, uh, if you bring down, a, uh, operationally bring down a port, if you bring any of these ports, and ECMP is selecting that path, yeah, bring, bring a port on the spine down, that's connected to a leaf. ECMP was still selecting that. No, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. St with static routing or not, it should work. The route is uh, next hop is marked as dead. We should yes. So, anyways, um, for s in order to show the demo, uh, so I I'm going to go into uh, what Arachne does. It has two parts. Like I said, one is the one that builds the fabric or the factory mode part where you build things, and then the other part is you say weave, and weave basically deploys it. All right. Uh, this is how Arachne looks like in, in, in theory. I'm just gonna show one pod here, multiple pods as you can see, I'm sorry. This is pod number two, multiple racks. All these are containers, right? They're all namespace containers. This is a container with a Linux bridge in it. A container with a Linux bridge on it. So this, are, this is sort of a rack with as many servers as you want, uh, connected to a single lift switch at the moment, which connects, and, and these are VEths, right? Uh, then each of these hosts and spines is connected to one big freaking uh, management bridge. Um, uh, Arachne has a workflow, which is um, um, you first design your network in English, nothing uh, fancy. You're required to understand a little bit of what uh, what a closed network means, you know what you know what a pod is, what a zone, what a spine, what a rack means. Those are the those are requirements. You have to understand what that means, and then you proceed to review your design until you're happy, and then you say weave. And when you weave it, it goes over and deploys it. Right? Okay. So, uh, okay. I I guess this is this is the part where you describe. These are the parameters you use to describe your network. So you say how many zones do you need? Uh, we support only one at the moment. Uh, how many pods you want? How many spines per pod? How many racks, hosts per rack? Uh, at the moment, we only support one single leaf, but it's not a challenge to do multiple. It's just we've never needed it, right? We're running this in software. We're not like really deploying this in hardware. Although there's absolutely no reason why you can take that design, the output of that design, and go and configure real hardware, right? Uh, so. This is uh, so. I'm gonna prob I'm gonna give a chance to to you, uh, Alex. Maybe you can uh, uh, this, and then we'll, I'll come back to mine. So you can show the design part first, maybe, right? How you design, and then we'll go back. So you you, sh you, you can you show this part probably. Yeah. So we just talked about this while he was sitting there with me. <laughs> I hope it's. It I hope the demo kings are are with us. Demo gods are gonna help us out today. Okay. Yeah, um, what Jamal already mentioned is that we have two pa phase. The first phase is um, the design phase, 
And for, ex for example, I started Arachne. Here's the Arachne shell. And we can type some commands inside, for example, show. And you can see, for example, the zone ID, what Jamal mentioned, the number of zone switches, which are the top uh, top switches. And then um, also the port per zone, spines per port, and um, the racks per port, and the number of servers per rack. And we have currently a very simple switch to uh, turn the layer 3 mode on, which means that the switches are routers and layer 2 to switch between layer 3 and layer 2. So if you don't like this design, then you can change it. Yeah, um, you can type view, and this will um, open a dot file viewer. This, uh, this is some uh, open source dot file viewer. And what you can see is <laughs> the pod, the pod 1 in zone 1. And here are the switches. If you can, if you zoom more closely, then we see the naming convention with Jamal already mentioned. These are the ports on the, on the switch, one, two, three, four, which are connected to the racks, which has a leaf, no, uh, leaf switch, um, leaf one and rack three. And you can see that the port three in the switch, uh, in the spine, two are connected to the rack three. So there's also some convention. And here are the um, servers who are connected to the leaves. And if you don't like the design, you can change it. For example, three, two pods, then you have something like that. Or can also change number of servers and then maybe yep the zone switches to two oops yeah I type with one hand sorry about that so and uh, it already looks like different but you can imagine that you make a bigger setup. Okay, so th so you basically that's the factory. You do that in the factory essentially on a laptop or whatever. And then the second stage is uh, maybe I'll just let you do the weaving part, right? Yeah. Um, I will restart the program because. I use the default value values which are which I can show again. That's the one pot with two bar spines for Rex and uh, a server on each rack. And then um, I need to connect because we. Um uh, what what Alex is probably not sure. Well, okay, there is a, a QMU VM here. That's what. Uh, so he's deploying from his laptop to the to the through a management switch inside QMU through a tap interface, and he's just as you can see, he's running IPROUT two commands here over SSH. So he's creating all of these things. Yeah. Right. As you can see, there's absolutely nothing that's. Uh, yeah, and then I type uh, weave, which uh, generates the network with IP route commands on the remote machine. And then it's uh, all 
it generates from the dot file the necessary namespaces. I can show you closely. Is this net and S? S is and and you can see that we still has each node has a namespace, a networking namespace, and um, we use that to I identify this. And then on the weave, we see that, for example, the this node is this on the rack one. So what we can show for demo is uh, ECMP. Um, I have. Yep. I need to regenerate it because um, I didn't set up the the layer three mode. Sorry, but then we can see that. Um, it's a small network, so <laughs> <laughs> we c we could build networks that take an hour sometimes. So you may be surprised. There's a dash host name there. I can explain it after <laughs> if we have time. So and it's done. Then I can type some trace route okay. command. Just into just before you do that, if you don't mind, I'll just put it back to here. So you basically have one of these. So you're gonna trace route from one from a one of the racks to another rack through the spine. Correct? Yes. Okay. See, the naming convention makes sense to people, I hope. It's host 3 on rack so 1. I make a trace route from rack 1 to rack 2. And then we can see we have, uh, it goes to the leaf 1, rack 1, which where the host is connected. And then it goes, but it the interesting part is the spine, because if you look up the design, design again, then we have two spines, and to show ECMP working, then we try to use another rack, and yeah, it's oh already working it worked, because yeah. <laughs> uh, it changed the path from... Come on, that's pretty cool. Uh, two uh, a little bit of a clap, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> to one. <Yeah. laughs> and then, yeah, I can also show the the routing table, oh, too much. And you see the uh, ECMP rule also here. That's on the leaf, yeah. Yeah. on one of the racks. Um, yeah. Okay, let me just, uh, maybe, uh, so it seems we still have time. I'll, I can go over the other stuff. Uh, you can talk to us after. So we wanted to actually go on the spine and bring down the port, but we're not, we didn't have time. <laughs> we didn't test it, so we don't want it to go bad. We're looking good so far. <laughs> okay, so we, we thr through the, the development of this, we, we ran into a few things. One is uh, uh, IP route 2 is, because we wanted to, we, were, we don't want to invent our own tool. We could easily write one, but then uh, why, not reuse existing tools. So IP route 2 doesn't like, uh, you know, if you have applications that require get host name, they need to keep the host name and if you don't have um, UTS uh, unshared, then the host name on one namespace gets replicated on all the namespaces and including the host. So there's a small IP route 2 patch when you saw Alex running the uh, weaving part, uh, it showed minus host name, so you can actually set the host name on the, on the container. Uh, we have some VETH names, that's a, uh, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, DHCP and IP binding, uh, it was a challenge to sort of bring up, we initially started by having the management port for each container, that the container's hooking up to, if you put up the diagram which shows the management port. Move to, that, um, uh, that management port uh, required us to um, that. So we were doing DHCP from here, but uh, we actually had some application that was trying to bind to an IP address that didn't exist yet. And you know, we could either go and fix the init or uh, we ended up using DHC client's hooks for binding. 
IPv6 stateless auto config was causing us tons of problems because as soon as you bring up a port, this thing starts sending um, uh, neighbor discovery and we ended up disabling it before we realized that um, we just needed STP, okay? <laughs> Python 2 and 3, freaking mess. <laughs> okay, you have 3.4 versus 3.3. We adopted Python. Uh, so eventually, we ended up doing uh, uh, just a binary blob. So you can develop in Python, you then uh, create the blob, and then you can run it on any laptop. Um, the bridge, well, there's a small patch that I think uh, is kosher right now to submit. Uh, LLC was not respected by VEth, so you send, uh, as soon as you connect two bridges on via VEth, they all come up saying STP state is forwarding and they start broadcasting all over the place. So we, uh, Alex has a simple patch to fix that. The bridge favoring the MAC lowest MAC address as a source. Now imagine here, you're bringing out thousands of these things, they're all connecting, they're all getting geographical MAC addresses and uh, and the management switch has an IP address here because we use it from outside to connect to this. And it keeps changing its MAC address because it likes to pick the lowest numbered one every time, right? So loss of confusion with uh, neighbor, uh, neighbor tables. So anyway, the, it turns out the solution was simple. I don't know how I can remember. That wasted about half a day of our time or a day maybe. But you, you, can, you can start create the bridge and fix a MAC address in your set. Um, other things, scaling issue, uh, anybody who's been using uh, DHCP on large scale, we had DNS mask, it sucks. Um, uh, basically, you, you have thousands of these things coming up and uh, DNS mask can only handle one at a time. And then it sends DHCP NACs to all these things. And that, that was a problem, right? Because we wanted to bring up all uh, the, the ports uh, we, we wanted to bring this thing as fast as now. We don't want to wait half a day for 10,000 nodes to be created. So we dropped DHCP eventually. And Alex comes to me and he says, okay, we can, if we don't do use DHCP, what do we use? I say, just it, oh, well, go. I was busy. So I said, use 192 slash 8 because we're using 10.1 slash 8 on the data path. Uh, then one day, GitHub was failing because GitHub uses that space. So. <laughs> So we ended up finding uh, the 25, there's a military, <laughs> the UK military has grabbed this number, this IP address 25.x in the 70s and never, uh, and it doesn't use it. We found out, uh, so that's what we use right now. I had, they're trying to sell it now, correct Alex? Alex found an article where they're gonna try and sell it. Don't buy it, please. Uh, the, then we ran into a port limit on the bridges, it was 1024. Uh, we have some really good suggestions from uh, NetConf. We'll, on how to fix that, we'll talk to, to you uh, after this. ARP table overflow all over the place. We had to tweak ARP garbage collection parameters. Shared file system, so if you run something like LLDP inside the container and you know Unix file descriptors are shared, we were quickly running out of file descriptors. And of course you can increase the file limits. Uh, okay, that, that, that was the scoop. There's a lot more on the paper. Uh, future work. We actually don't have this quite working. What I bragged about as the biggest feature, it doesn't quite work yet. Where you actually build a rack and then you ship it, you weave it, and it connects to the other data center uh, pod. Uh, we want to publish numbers on very large size networks. Uh, so we recently acquired a 256 gig server machine. We want to see how much, how much we can beat that thing into how many namespaces can we create out of it. We also, uh, can you put like a pod network uh, or, or, yeah, that's good enough. So we're also looking at, instead of actually having these uh, Linux bridges, we'll use an embedded NIC uh, sub switch. It's very easy for us to do. It's, we don't care if it's virtual or physical. It's just another bridge. Uh, and we can deploy this. We can really deploy this on real hardware as long as, you know, we're allowed to make changes to MAC addresses, etc. IPv6 support is not there. We're also thinking about a seven-stage clause. We're also thinking in the design phase, we're gonna have constraint design templates where you say, I've got a Dell switch, which has 48 ports that are only 10 gig. And then when someone tries to design something, they can pick the switches they want. And we'll use the Linux bridge to pretend that it's one of those switches. Uh, Chaos Monkey is in progress. Uh, what, what is missing from here is as well TDC support. And we're gonna open source this tool.
Uh, attribution to images, the first one that you saw was from McGill, uh, the closed network was from Wikipedia, the HP pod is somewhere in the net, and I forgot to add attribution to Cumulus for their copyrighted diagram, which I, I, I looted off some site, but, but they're here, so. Okay, uh, that's it. Questions, we have five minutes or so. Uh, did they d did they ask you guys to see if maybe the next iteration of this could do the same thing, but let's say with dynamic routing protocols running in each namespace? Actually, Cumulus hasn't seen this. This is the first time they're probably seeing it. <laughs> but I, I don't look. I know people like BG their BGP. I uh, I don't think we need it. Uh, you want to have a rebuttal on that? I, I, I don't think you need BGP. All this complexity of VXLAN and we're just running native routing if we need to, but layer two is good enough for us. Uh, so I have one comment to make. I, I think it, it's a question of what it is that you're trying to test, right? If what you're trying to test is effectively Linux kernel data path functions, then this is good enough. If you're trying to validate network failover situations, is your ACL going to hold in the case of massive failure in your spine and whatnot, you have to incorporate the control plane. You need to have BGP in the picture because like we were talking about in the case of link failure, the control plane will operate differently from data plane failure, right? So things that static routing will do will be different from a dynamic path. Um, so yeah, I think uh, dynamic routing, in my opinion, should be added at some point. But that's, uh, Jamal, if I understood your talk correctly, it, that's an application yeah, of this yeah. infrastructure. You, right? can, uh, you, can, uh, you can go and add FRR there, we don't S care. So one comment yeah. I had was yeah. you, you pa wished past or swished past Ansible. Okay. I would actually say go back and look at Ansible again because if what you're trying to do, effectively what you've done is you've built... This part here. Yeah. Wha yeah. Because what you're doing, right? I mean, this is... There are, I would say, in the Fortune 100 companies, maybe there are two or three companies that don't have the problem that you're trying to solve explicitly, right? They are just doing it with physical hardware. And the way they are doing it is all, almost all of them are using some automation tool, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of that is it becomes pluggable modules and you can expand rather than a whole scripted IP route command set you put it in Ansible and you let Ansible's reaction model work so that it follows a realistic deployment, right? That way a test environment and reality are more in line with each other. So we, we're happy when we open source it. We, we, we are not experts on Ansible, so that's why... Yeah, we can probably... We know how to run IP net and S, okay. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay. We got uh, 15 minutes for the next before the next speaker. Wow! I I thought we we're never going to finish this. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.